Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia and we are here getting ready to sketch another insect. I've been having good conversation in the chat with um, Susan and Hashi about insects that we can draw. Now, um, the one I was really excited to share last week about, because I looked at under the specimen and under the microscope, and look at all of the beautiful colors. I got so excited that I wanted to share it with you. Yeah, exactly. Susan's holy rainbow Batman. Yeah, so it's like all of the colors, and I love it. Although the... Um, the common name for this species is the Western Red-Bellied Tiger Beetle. Um, and watch me get this, watch me get tongue-tied on this one. The species is Cisandella sedesimpunctata. Punctata. Yeah, Sedesim punctata. So, um, Cisandella is the genus of all tiger beetles out there. Um, not all tiger beetles. Um, Cisandella is the most common genus of, uh, tiger beetles. It's probably the largest one. Um, the tiger beetle grouping where they separate tiger beetles from all the other beetles is actually a subfamily. So, Cisandellini, oh, I'll write it in for us. Uh, Cisandellini is a subfamily. Um, and all insect subfamilies end in I-N-A-E, similar to all families ending in I-D-A-E. And... If I were a small prey insect, I'd be proud to be eaten by this fellow. That's true. It's so absolutely beautiful. Um, Sedesim is 16. Yes, exactly. And so that's why it, it took me a minute to think. So its name, Sedesim means 16, and Punctata means spots. Um... Uh, I think of, when I hear punctata, I think of punctate, um, which is that texture on the exoskeleton where there are the, looks like there was a pin that was, um, like poking the exoskeleton, so you have, like, little dots, but I think in this case they are actually referring to the 16, wow, it's beautiful this way too, um, the 16 spots on the elytra. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on each side. Uh, so you get 16. Keep in mind that this little kind of shiny gold dot here is not a spot. That's the top of the pin. Um, so that's the pin that's holding our friend. Oh, no. Our beautiful tiger beetle is already missing a leg. I collected, um, so this was a, uh, this is a tiger beetle that was collected in Madera Canyon in Arizona. Um, I actually think, yeah, this is one of the new specimens, so I collected it this summer, um, this July when I was here, and let's see, I have a couple of this species, I collected two or three of them, so, um, that's okay. All right. You're a grammarian. You think punctuation. Ooh. And I guess that's kind of like a dot on the end of the sentence. That's fun. So, Cisandella. Sedesim. Punk. And so the, uh, sorry, I, I wrote it too long. Um, it's a, it's a long scientific name. And so the common name is the Western Red-Bellied Tiger Beetle. That's a mouthful. We're going to call it the Western Red-Bellied Tiger so it fits on the paper without me changing it. All 
Alright, good. Um, so, looking at our specimen here, I think I want to draw it from a, a lateral perspective. I don't know. If we drew it dorsally, I could change the angle of the head so it looked like it was looking up and we could draw the awesome mandibles. Look at that scutellum! Uh-oh. He has a puncture. So they're named red bellied, so it makes me want to look on the bottom to see if they actually do have a red ventral side. And those are little clusters of CD, so those are um, little clusters of white hairs. And it looks like the bottom of the abdomen is red. Okay, I like lateral. Good. I want to see this really quick, and then we'll flip them to the... We... I think my, uh... may have been distracting when I was pinning this guy, but he does have the red bottom of its abdomen. Let's go lateral. On the side with all the legs. <laughs> should be fun. Even it's, even it's legs are metallic, guys. Oh, there. Okay. I want to get most of, I want to see if I can get all of the body in the picture for our first sketch. <laughs> Some beetles just got to be extra. Yeah. Legs are so long. And these guys are really fast. Um, it took me a, a, a number of tries to actually catch it. Alrighty. Okay. Alright, um... We have um, a handful of fun words that we're going to be able to talk about today. Uh, the head has the compound eyes. You've got fairly large mandibles, uh, filiform antenna, long straight antenna. And then the legs are going to be considered running legs. They're very, very thin. They're very, very long. And um, they <laughs> are uh, adapted to running incredibly fast. I couldn't give you a, uh, a number for this species, but... Um, they are some of the fastest runners by, by size, so pretty, pretty nifty. Uh, tiger beetles actually can't see while they're running. I think I've told you those things before. Um, let's go. Like, I'm not sure. If you have any questions about tiger beetles, just let me know. 
there are some species of tiger beetles that um, can only be found in very small regions of the deserts in Arizona. And so that's kind of a cool th factoid. All right, when I am sketching... When I'm sketching up here, the front of the head, I like to, I always start at the head. When I'm sketching up here at the head, what I'm going to do is give myself light arch here. Oh, you are here for previous tiger beetle. Oh, good. Okay. So that's, that, that makes me happy too. Um, can we get a length? Yes, we can. I'm going to change the focus just an itty bit. Alrighty, from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen without the genitalia that seems to have... Oh, look at that! Exactly one centimeter. 1.00. Um, centimeters from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen. That's like never happened. That's fun. I always give a point, um, zero, one, like, standard deviation. So I generally drop the second, uh, decimal place and just do round to the first one. You know, to give me a little bit of error there for, uh, um, for, for human error. Isn't this six spotted bigger? Yes. This isn't a huge tiger beetle. I think the six spotted was larger. This is also a male, and males tend to be smaller than the females. Um, he's uh, sticking out his uh, reproductive stuff, so we'll turn it and look at it at the end of class. <clears throat> so, tiger beetles are so fast that they actually cannot see while they are running. I'm actually, I'm starting this head too big. I'm going to make it smaller. Because um, I need space for those long legs, too. So tiger beetles actually can't see while they're running because the world is moving by so fast that they don't, their brains can't comprehend the world around them. They run that fast. And so people like to, um, people like to describe it like, um, in Star Wars when you go into hyperdrive and all of the stars just like zoom around you, that's what they think they looks like. It's just like everything is zooming by super duper fast. Um, so I started with kind of a light sketch of where the uh, compound eye might be and then down the head. I stopped it kind of um, flat because this is where those mandibles are. Um, they're going to be moving away from you and towards you. Uh, but we're going to be zooming in to look closer at those. Hard to see while you're running at the speed of light. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so they actually, uh, their antenna are very important during this process, during the running front, during when they're running. Guys, sorry. Um, their antenna are really important while they're running because um, they use their antenna to make sure they're not running into things. Um, they have incredible reflexes, so the minute their antenna touches that they're going to run into something, they can go over it, around it, scale it, um, or open up their wings and try and fly, um, just like over it a little bit. Um, yeah, so there was a, uh, there were some scientists that, there were some scientists that did some research on tiger beetles in their site because they were curious you know, how in the world does this beetle run around without running into things? Um, unfortunately, scientists are sometimes not very uh, thoughtful of, of insects' feelings because um, they took half of the tiger beetles and they trimmed their antenna so that to see if their antenna was making them run into walls. It's actually kind of a sad research project, but it exists out there. And um, somebody did it and determined that, yes, um, tiger beetles need their antenna so they don't run into things. Um, 
So we've got the head. This next segment back here is the pronotum. It's not completely straight from what we're seeing here. Um, it looks like where the, the top of the compound eye is, there's almost like a little M. There's two arches. Um, I'm going to kind of start that a little bit, but when we zoom in, I'm sure that there's going to be more detail to this. And then it arches backwards. This is the pronotum on the top. So the top right here would be considered the pronotum, but the bottom where the leg is connected is the prosternum. So we're going to see that there's um, a separation of plates here. It probably looks like a U. Um, and then you've got the bottom of this first segment of the thorax. All right, so you got a pronotum here. Uh, it looks like we're going to be able to see the coxy and trochanter because these legs are um, so long. But we'll probably be bringing them up high and then back down before the face so that we leave um, the face details alone. That's what I'm thinking. Oh, no! That's very sad, Susan. I didn't know that about the poor frogs. Yeah, so some, some, sometimes scientists, um, I don't think, and in many labs still, insects are not considered an animal. So you don't, um, they, uh, scientists who work with insects don't have to follow the same regulations that, is, say, somebody who is working with mice or rats or even fish have to deal with. Um, so the next piece back is our elytra here. Um, it looks like we are going to be able to see a little bit of that scutellum up at the top. So I'm going to kind of create this little triangle up here and then just give it a nice kind of arch. Um, keep in mind, we've got this U here. This is kind of like the lateral line. This is the, the middle of the body and the, um, elytra are going to kind of line up with it. So if we come here, we're going to wrap around, almost kind of line up here, and then come down. Then they cut off a second leg. <gasps> That's sad! <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I don't think that's how physics works, Susan. Your second and third message came in a kind of later, so I thought that that was the story. Oh man. Alright, so you've got the elytra here, and then you're going to have the bottom of the the uh, the rest of the thorax and then the abdomen, but it is kind of connected up here. So I'm going to create a little bit of a waist on the bottom. Um, when we zoom in, we're going to be able to see that a little better, I believe. And then we're going to come up here, and the end of the abdomen does kind of angle up and meet the elytra here at the end, it looks like. And then we are going to have some type of stuff coming out over there. Um, and that gives us, I think, a pretty good start for our tiger beetle. The front legs are going to be something... You know what? Normally they do hold their legs forward, though. And I don't want to change it just because of my drawing. I bet you we could make them be so far forward that they're in front of the head. So let's go, I'm curious, let's get a couple of measurements on the lengths of the parts of the legs before we, uh, before we move forward. Because at this focus, I can actually, I can get true measurements. So let's see. The femur on the front leg is 0.16 centimeters, and then the rest of the leg is pretty much straight, well, let's see, 
I'm gonna take three measurements and then add them together. <laughs> Give me a moment. So that I have a pretty accurate read on this leg. So it looks like 0 0.51, 0 0.11, and 0 0.16. That comes out to 0 0.27, 0 0.78. Point seven eight centimeters. So you could almost round it up to point eight. Um, is the length of the front leg. So the length of the front leg is almost equivalent to the entire body, right? Point eight and one. That's wild. And I don't think the front leg is the longest one, actually. I think the hind leg is the longest one. Let's let's measure the hind leg. Now I'm curious. Sorry guys, give me two seconds. So the femur comes up to this point here. And then, but it is kind of coming towards us. So I want, no it's not, we're good. And then here to here. And then here to the very end. Way longer than the length of the body. The uh the femur is point two one, the tibia is point four two, and then the tarsi are point four eight. So combined they come out to point nine plus point two one. 1.11. Yes. 1.1 centimeters is the length of that hind leg. That's awesome. Alrighty. Let's zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Sometimes my microscope camera is not the same as the camera on the uh, computer. So every now and again it gets a little wonky while I'm... It's beautiful. It's funny how different it looks on the um, on the computer. The lighting is, I don't know how that is a thing. I think I know. So when you're looking into a microscope, there's the there's the two eyepieces. And even though my um, my microscope is trinocular, so it's got the two here, and then it's got the one for the camera back here, the camera's lens actually just looks through the left side. So if you ever notice, I look at my um, microscope just through the right side, and it's not because I only want to use one eye. It's because the camera is taking up this side here. Um, and the camera's view is, what, probably like this... There's probably like an inch um, between the left side and the right side, but the the colors are different because it's looking at a slightly different angle. I think that's what's happening. That's cool. 
Alrighty. Alright, so, um, that's not fully lateral, is it? It's gotta be. It's fine. It's pretty. Alright, um, our tiger beetle here, uh, when I, when I first put this eye in, I made it very round, but it looks like it's a little bit, um, wider on the top than on the bottom. We're gonna, like, lengthen out this head just a little bit, so I'm just gonna fix that really quick. So, right here, I'm gonna kind of flatten it up off of the top and then round it down and just make sure that the bottom of the eye is narrower than the top. Yeah, I'm happier with that. So, um, after we get this guy done, you can actually kind of see the, um, the metallic region of the top of the compound eye on the other side. So, um, imagine it like if you were looking at it from the top, um, the exoskeleton that is just like this beautiful rainbow color, um, kind of covers and protects the eyes going in this direction. So it, there's this little hill here that comes up here and here. And so when you're looking at it from the side, um, you're not actually seeing the compound eye on the other side. You're looking at the really pretty metallic color back there. All right, I'm going to give my tiger beetle a little bit more of a neck than um, it had originally. So I'm going to take the head here and kind of start up here um, and give it just a little bit of a neck. I'm going to give it just a little bit of a horizontal line before I come down. And it looks like I want to make sure I come and round it down just a little bit. Um, the uh, So the compound eye on the other side... going to be something like this. Cool. And I would love to see some of your um, images with color if uh, that is something that you are doing. Um, so from the front of the head right here, um, feel like that's the labrum and that you would consider this part right here kind of in between the antenna and above like this little arch right here i think you would consider that the clippius the part that connects to the upper lip here of the mandibles um kind of in between the antenna and down in front of the face that's what we would call the clippius and so it looks like the clippius is kind of arched right here in the center but it probably has a point here on the right side and then actually another point on the other side. So looking at it from a completely lateral perspective, it would look more like this with a, with a point in the center. And then you've got up in front here, there's the labrum or the upper lip spelled this way. And it's very square, and it does have some punctations up there on the front that I think I'm going to add. I'm going to make sure that I add it just to this arch, the first arch part here. Uh, I lied. It needs to go all the way over. It just looks funny. I'm going to arch it back just a little bit. I think that's better. Can you see the color shift if you rotate the insect in your hand? Yes. Yeah, if you look at um, these beetles from different perspectives, the colors do change. 
Alright. I think that looks about right. And then, um, after here, you're going to be adding these mandibles. These mandibles are going to connect a little bit further back than I had originally planned, but you want to make sure they're connecting kind of right there under the eye anyway. So, up to the front. And they each look like they have one tooth, so they're like sharp in the point, and then they have one additional tooth right there in the middle. You can see it right here. That guy right there is part of this mandible. It comes out and then goes a second time. Oops! That's a proboscis! Point. These are, they look pretty thin to me. I think it's going up too much. Sorry guys, give me a second to get this uh, lateral, the lateral perspective on mouth parts is a little, can be a little bit tricky for me too. So, definitely something to practice. That looks like it could be better. And then it does, it's kind of darker around the edges. Has this white spot, I think that's going to help mine look more realistic. And then I'm going to add the one on the other side, and the one on the other side is just coming through in this direction. Okay. So tiger beetle grubs are also really cool. Um, tiger beetles are generally found in sandy environments and that's because their grubs create little tunnels, little tubes in the sand. So what I'm looking at now are the maxillary and the labial palp. So I was trying to see how many segments they are right here under the mandibles. So this next one right here is the what we would consider the maxillary. Let me spell that for everybody. The maxillary palps, and that is this one right here. And they appear to be three segmented right here. They're connected to the maxilla, which is why they're called the maxillary palps. That's the mouth part that is just underneath the mandibles. A lot of times you can't see the maxilla. It's just another little small segment in here that's kind of short, but you generally can see the maxillary palps, which I happen to tend to call mouth fingers. Um, now, the uh, labial palps are the ones that are connected to the bottom, and I would believe that that is this segment right here. And it's really hard to count how many segments it has. But you can see it's a lot thinner, and it's coming up from the bottom, kind of underneath the mandibles here. So I'm actually going to make it kind of come up in here, rather than connecting down underneath. Um, alrighty, so that gives us a lot of stuff happening on the head. You've got the mandibles, you've got the palps. I'm going to... 
crosshatch within the compound eyes. I bet you we could see The eyes aren't as fun as the um, antenna are, or as the exoskeleton is. All right. What I'm trying to see are the antenna and where they are connected. That's what I'm doing. So it looks like the antenna are connected here. Um, right here in front of the compound eye. That's where the socket is. I'm going to make my antenna um, come kind of back like this. Actually, well, see, generally tiger beetles are going to be, their antenna are going to be forwards because that's the direction that they need to be able to make sure they are not running into things. I'm going to make them go forward. I'm going to make them go very much like this. I only pull them backwards like this when I pin just to protect them so that uh, they don't get hurt. Um, when the antenna are over the body, the body is almost like a protection for them. But if the antenna are in front of the specimen, it's a lot easier to accidentally knock into it and break the antenna. Uh, the... Escape is that segment right there. I just focused down on the um, on the far side one so that you can see the shape pretty well. Um, it's going to connect right around here. It's narrower at that base, kind of bulbous out on the top here. I'm going to go ahead and erase this little segment here that I don't need anymore. There. All right, and then from there, the scape, you've got the pedestal. Uh, the pedestal tends to be an itty-bitty tiny segment. There you can see it on this far side, right? There, that itty-bitty segment. And so it's going to be... Very much like that. And then the rest of the antennal segments I'm going to add after we do the leg, I think. I want to get the leg up here, and then I'll finish the antenna. And the last of the segments are called the flagellum. All right. Let's do this. So now we can scooch our view down and check out the pronotum. Um, the head we tend to spend a lot of time on, but it's just because there's so many cool characters on the, on the head, and the mouth parts tend to be kind of complex. Now this is one of those specimens that having one of those white pens would be really cool to do because you'd be able to put all the colors in and then you'd be able to use one of those like white pens to add all the hairs on top. Are they like paint pens? I feel like I've seen them before in some beautiful, beautiful journaling. Each one of those hairs go into what seems to be like a, a, almost like a socket in the exoskeleton. So I wonder if they are also sensory hairs, kind of going deeper into the exoskeleton than just sitting on the top. I just put my pencil some, oh there it is. <laughs> I almost lost my pencil. It seems like antenna and legs are easy to break off. Uh, they are only that 
not fragile on specimens that are dead. Um, you can't just accidentally bump off a tiger beetle's leg if you barely touch it. Um, it's just because the specimens are dry, and so when they're dry, um, the muscles that are holding the ins holding the pieces of exoskeleton together are also kind of solidified. They're dry. So if you bump a real insect, the insect will move its body part and use the muscles to contract. But if you bump essentially what is just an exoskeleton um, with muscles locked into place, if you barely bump it, you just break the muscle and then the, it falls off. So you'll never really see specimens break in the middle of a segment. You'll uh, you see like the segments fall off. Uh, the only time you see it different is if you have a bad, if you put the pin through and it's at a bad location, so you move it. Sometimes you'll see pieces of exoskeleton that are broken that way, but most of the time, it's at the segments. All right, so it looks like. It looks like the tiger beetle has a little bit of a collar. So right here where we thought that it looked like there was an indent here. There kind of is because it comes down and it goes up and it looks almost as if the tiger beetle has this little collar here. And I'm going to, I actually, I made it a little bit more pronounced than his is, but I think that's okay. And um, funny enough, I thought that this arch was U-shaped, but it is not. The arch is going very much in the other direction. So it comes down like so, and then arches up. so cool and then we've got um, it actually pinches on both sides of the pronotum it looks like so you've got it comes up kind of flat like a table and then once it gets closer to the end it comes down comes back up and finishes and I made it just a little bit longer than um, I had previously but I think that's just because I made the head a little bit bigger so everything is scooting back just a little bit and I think that that's okay as long as everything stays um, approximate all right so that's what we've got here you can always go ahead and add all of those little hairs so the little punctations here along the edge of the print around you could even call it the lateral um, the edge of the pronotum here and then all of those hairs that kind of come up from each one of those little dots. Uh, you also have a series of what four hairs that are on this first two three four in the middle part here. Now I think of it when I've eaten crab legs they are not easy at all to break at the joints. Yes! Yep, they are both made of chitin. And um, if a person is allergic to shellfish, then you are likely also allergic to eating insects. They're made out of the same thing, and the allergen is the same for eating. go. Oof. All right, so looking, oh, I didn't add the cross hatching. All right, so the bottom here is not, I have it connected way up here, but we're moving everything back. So it's connected right around here. It's going to come in. And then out. All 
All right, so that's going to be our approximate shape for the pronotum. Um, it kind of arches down a little bit here, but you also have the coxa. So uh, the coxa is this hip bone down here, and you can see it. Let's go ahead and just refocus on it. So this piece right here. Um, so it's connected right about here in the middle, and then it comes down. It's a little bit bulbous. And admittedly, I think this might be a piece we're not going to be able to see once we get the... Yeah, because I want the femur to go up. So the other part that you can see from this angle, but I'm not going to be drawing it on mine, is the trochanter. It's this little triangular piece right here. It connects the coxa to the femur, and it's a little bit tricky um, to see from this angle, but this is that segment. You can see there's that little bit of a shiny line here, and then it comes down. So they tend to be little kind of pizza slice shaped um, segments of the leg that exist in between the coxa and the femur so that it has kind of a knee. So it's wide and short, and so that it has the ability to kind of bend that's all. Alrighty. Now I want to zoom out to see some of these leg parts in comparison to the size of the body because they're pretty big and I want to make sure I'm getting them about the right length. I think in previous tiger beetles my legs may not have even been long enough. So the femur, I'm actually going to be kind of dividing this um, the coxa in half, and then when it bends in this direction, the trochanter would be on the inside, so that's why we're not drawing it. Um, looks like the inside of the leg is nice and straight, and the outside has a little bit of shaping to it. It looks almost like a bicep. So it starts, it gets wider, and then it gets nice and narrow. <laughs> looks like a bicep. So I'm going to make the femur come nice and straight on the inside, but then I am going to kind of cap it off, and the uh, it's going to get wider before it gets narrower. And then I'm going to erase this detail that the leg goes over. Including the segment, that half of the coxa. Because I want my, I want it to be forward. Hello Dante! Maybe I did draw it a bit long. that sometimes I want to change the specimen so the characteristics don't get in the way, but you're right. I think that the femur is more... like that. I'm just change... I'm trying to change the angle a little bit. We are 
so Dante, we are looking at a western red-bellied tiger beetle. So its species is Cisindella sedesim punctata. It means 16 spots. All right, so that gives us um, at least an image of the tibia. You can see what looks like, um, oh, there is a tibial spine on it. So, there is a tibial spine on the very end of it. This one here is a tibial spine. This one that you can see kind of behind it here and here, those are palps. So if our... Our leg is going to go right through the head. That makes me so sad. That's fine. We can actually, we might just be able to get rid of the... Uh, Um, second segment of the antenna. Alright, so then the femur is coming up, the tibia is going to come forward, and admittedly the uh, tibia just looks like it's the same length as the femur, so I'm going to kind of take this shape and kind of swing it out a little bit, and that's going to be the length. It stays really, really nice and thin the whole way through. Um, the uh, leg type for tiger beetles, these are what we call cursorial legs. Um, I think of cursorial, when I think of cursorial, I think of cursive, like really fast writing. Um, but cursorial means running legs. It looks like we have five tarsal segments after the tibia here. Um, there are three that are kind of moving forward, and then in this specimen, his toes just decided to curl sideways a little bit. That's kind of funny. So we've got five tarsal segments happening here, um, and they are going to come kind of like down towards the ground. It looks like what I'm going to do is... What I actually might do is the first two or three, I'm going to keep only bend a little bit. So let's see, it's, we're going to go one, two, three, and then four and five, maybe we will make them angled like forward. Or give me a minute while I think about what, what this looks like. I want them to be down further. because tiger beetles hold their tarsi more down. I was putting them out pretty far. We're going to go one, two, three, four, five. I just think they've got to be so much longer. more like it because if you straighten this leg out it's going to be um, 80% the length of the body right our front leg um, 
it's the length of the front leg was 0.8 centimeters and the whole body from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen was one centimeter. I think that we got the uh, the leg figured out. Sorry, the leg took me a, a minute because they're so long, but um, when I get the focus on the body, on the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, it's really easy to get those really vibrant colors to show up, but when I focus then up on the legs, even though I can see some of the vibrant colors, it's really difficult to get the focus just right so that such a small frame um, is in focus enough to see the metallics on it, but pretty cool. Let's continue. All right, so this is what the elytra abdomen look like. Where, ooh, look at how pretty. Okay, look at this. So wherever there are punctations on the elytra, there are darker blue spots. And then where it's up above, it's more red-orange. So not only are there the eight white spots here along the elytra, but the punctations make the colors of the, uh, makes the colors change. You took the measurements earlier. I have the total, but do you remember the section lengths? You're right. I probably should have measured the section lengths. I didn't. No problem, Dante. I'm glad that you were able to watch the uh, to watch the Dobson fly. Um, he was actually really fun to sketch too. Oh, I wonder if Courser comes from Cursorial. Hmm. I could see that almost looking kind of spidery, but I think that once I get the hind and the middle legs kind of straight, um, I think that it'll all look nice. That's what we're hoping. It'll come together. I'm sure of it. So, the elytra here... Where it touches the pronotum, you can see that scutellum just a little bit. So, I'm just gonna... You can see that scutellum right here as that, that triangular piece. Let's see, we've got this one, it comes up, and then it looks like instead of kind of coming down like this, the scutellum is this triangular piece, kind of comes down and um, down from that top peak and then up a little bit from where we originally thought. So that's where the scutellum kind of fits in. And then along the front edge of the elytra here, there's the secondary ridge. So I'm just going to kind of run a parallel line um, to this front one here. And then all we've got to do is make sure that we are happy with the shape of the elytra and go ahead and um, finalize that guy here because I think we're doing pretty good. Um... So pretty. And I think that that's that, Susan. You said the first tarsal segment each looks like it's half of the length of the tibia. So I lengthened the first one. Maybe the other ones are going to have to be lengthened too. Well, um, I'm going to see what it looks like with the middle and the hind legs. I might be coming back to that front leg. I will not admit defeat. <laughs> All right, I'm coming back. So originally when I had sketched um, the elytra, I kind of ended it with this downward pointing angle, and I'm actually going to scoop it up a little bit at the end. Yeah, I'm going to scoop it up at the end. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to come along here. We're going to give it just the tiniest.
tiniest bit of an upward arch right here in the middle. And then instead of going down, we're gonna scoop it up nicely. And then up here from the top, from the, skew t from the point of the scutellum, we're gonna take it and angle it down. And then it um, it's mostly parallel along the top. And then it has, it's like a little bit stronger angle at the end here. I'm gonna go ahead and erase any of these kind of sketchy lines that I don't need. Don't need any of that. Um, and then on the other side of the scutellum, you can see that there's this little bit of a divot here. And I always like to make sure that it's kind of flat. So I'm gonna take and add just a little bit of the other side of the uh, elytra to give it that little bit of depth. Itty bitty tiny bit of depth. All right. Um, and actually from this view, you can see that the, uh, that the main body does connect at this point, but then um, the, the thorax looks like there's like two lumps here. Those are actually the coxal segments or those hip bones. Um, but we're gonna make it just come out a little bit to a little bit after where we expected our hind legs to come off. And then I'm not gonna make this one solid yet. I'm gonna add a little sketchy line because you know what? We can see the expanded trochanter on the hind leg. And that's a characteristic of all carabids. Um, all ground beetles. And guess what? A tiger beetle is in is a subfamily of ground beetles. Cool stuff. All right. Um, so I've got this little bit of a body here. Um, we're going to be adding the uh, the expanded trochanter here when we add the leg so that it kind of lines up with that. But we can zoom in and... get the abdominal segments and I believe they call that the adegus yes so I just looked it up to make sure that I also knew how to spell it um, And then I still may have missed up. Yep, I mixed up the E and the A. A E D E A G U S, the Adegus. Um, that is that male reproductive organ kind of sticking out at the end. And funny enough, um, tiger beetles and. Um, uh, bloop, 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 bloop. Jewel beetles are regularly identified by their, the males are regularly identified by their adegus. Because um, every key is different. Because every lock is different. Would you happen to have the coffee bean weevil? Huge coffee and weevil admirer. Oh. You know, I do not have a specimen of the coffee boring beetle. Um, but what I do have is a whiteboard YouTube video about it. Um, I think I have a four minute video about the coffee boring beetle. Unless the coffee boring beetle is not a weevil, it's a different type of beetle. I would have to look into it. Um, <laughs> I don't think I have it though, sadly. Weevils are super cute. I do have a new species of weevil um, that is pinned too. Uh, so I've been I've been actively pinning for the last couple of weeks because I've been teaching a pinning class and so I have this like huge intake um, increase of specimens that I can show you on the microscope. Good. Uh, 
I will admit, I think when I drew that video, that was actually many years back, and I was still hand drawing on an actual whiteboard rather than recording my drawings on a on a computer screen. So that's like old school uh, Insectopia, but it was still a lot of fun to make. Um, so I'm over here trying to count abdominal segments and getting distracted by you guys. I love chatting with you so much. One, two, three, four. Uh, let's do it in the microscope. One, two, three, four. Five-ish. to have four major segments here. I'm gonna guess that there's, I think that there's five, but um, the last one is kind of opened up to kind of push this adegas out, which means that um, that last segment is a little bit trickier to see, but I'm gonna go ahead and subdivide these until four up until right around here, and then we'll have the adegas. So um, one, two, three, four. That looks about right. And you can see that each one of these do have steps. We don't have to worry about where they connect with the lateral. We just go up and connect it. So um, make sure that it is a little bit narrower than where the than where the thorax ends because you can see we're going to be adding some stuff in there too. And we're just going to add each one of these segments at steps. That's too narrow. Alrighty. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. That's actually not horrible because it does get pretty narrow up here at the end. Um, four. Yeah, the, uh, let me look up and make sure the coffee bean weevil is the same as the coffee boring beetle. No! The coffee boring beetle is actually a bark beetle. Oh, but it's still a curculionid. Cool. Getting sidetracked. I'm going to have to look into... Oh, no! I lost my forward-facing camera. Oh, my, uh... My camera decided it was time for me to sleep, I think. That's kind of funny. All right, so, oops. Looking in the wrong direction, towards the light. Okay, so, um, from here, we have this last abdominal segment to do. So we have um, five, and you can see right in this general region, kind of where it opens up and the adegas expands out. So if I start right around here, I'm going to go kind of tall on the top and on the bottom here so that it so that it kind of looks like it's opening up. I might even add the separation between the top and the bottom because really where it is opening here at the last segment is between the the uh, tergites and the sternites. Uh, the tergites being the ones on the top and the sternites being the ones on the bottom. Tergites? Sternites. Ventrites. Tergites and sternites. Alrighty. And then right here at the very end, it gets kind of pokey back here, so I'm just gonna. 
kind of bring it around. Um, it also looks, it's kind of funny because it looks almost flower-like, um, where it looks like it's kind of opening up and then it's pointed here at the end. And it's longer than that, so I'm going to make it nice and long. That was bad. this. So what I ended up doing to get that shape about right is I created this uh, kind of sharper point here and then I followed along the inside until I got to the very end and kind of created a shape like this. That's the type of shape it looks like. It looks like it's kind of curled around. Um, and then that is actually inside of another segment kind of like this and then that's where this last abdominal segment so this is what I am seeing and tried to draw really small down there and was having a problem with it but sometimes just drawing something a little bit bigger so you can focus on the details a little bit more makes it easier so something like that right here My username and email are based on its binomial name, too. Aw, cute! That's really sweet. So, you would be a weevil if you were an insect. Is there a reason why you choose weevils? Do you like their long rostrum, the long snout, or is it something else? start adding the coxa of the, uh, well, we can call them the meso and the metacoxa. Coxy. So the mesococci would be the one in the middle, and the metacoxy is the hind one. So if we're looking, there is actually a division. There's a segment right around here in the middle because you've got the second leg and the third leg, and they're on two different um, they're on two different pieces of the thorax. So I'm just gonna come on in here and add that coxa that kind of comes down. It's gonna line up with the procoxa here, and then the uh, metacoxa actually is nice and wide here and continues down. So it doesn't create a bump here because the metacoxa is actually a coxal plate if you were to look at it from the bottom. Um, in fact, I think, yeah, I'll show you something. The coxal plate, it starts here, but you see this dark line here that comes up to the edge? That's actually the edge of the coxa of that, that kind of hip bone. So if we, the mesococcus is kind of this little piece here, but the metacoxa is more like that. It's a coxal plate. All right, so the, the femur connecting to this one, I believe that the femurs, yeah, from a, from a first perspective, the femurs are all the, um, the s approximately the same length. So whatever the length of your first one is, if you're pretty sure that it's ish, we're going to just do these ones. Um, so they're going to be about the same length. They're going to come, I'm thinking right around 
around there, which is about the same as that one anyway. Um, it looks like they are a little bit wider at the base than at the end, so we're going to give it this nice wide femur at the base. Kind of comes up, narrow, wide. Something along that line. Okay, just figured you wouldn't bother any other any other animals. That makes sense. You don't have to look perfect to perform well. That's true. Um, they are very very unique. Have you ever seen a Have you ever seen a giraffe weevil? Giraffe weevils are crazy because it looks like they have a really long neck, too. And there's a good number of weevils that spread disease. But, uh, <laughs> they are pretty goofy and pretty fun. The tibia looks a little bit longer than the femur in um, at this angle here. So you can see the femur is from right about here all the way to this little line here. It's this metallic red guy. So or, the femur comes up. This is the tibia, nice and narrow and thin. Um, and it looks like the tibia is longer than the femur. So, and it's even narrower. <laughs> kind of like that. And I'll go ahead and erase any of these lines of the body that go through the legs and fix that up really quick. All right, femur, tibia. And then we've got some tarsal segments. And the tarsal segments here might be a little bit easier to connect compare to the tibia because they look like they're on the same. Um, plane. Where the tibia touch on the side of the legs, it was making me feel like that they were flipping, but they are not. Okay. So, the length of the legs are one of those things that are important for tiger beetles. So, the tibia is this one here, and then these are the tarsal segments, the ones that are a little shorter. You've got one, two, three, four, five. I believe these guys have a 555 tarsal formula. So let's see, we've got five, and then we're gonna start angling them out just a little bit. The first one is about a third of the length of the tibia, so we're gonna go right about like that. And then the remainder all get smaller. So one, two, three, four, Five. So, I would go rectangular for the first two segments, triangular for about two, and then a raindrop shape. And for sure, I think I'm going to need to make the front leg longer. At least the tibia, I think. To make it even, to make it all match. All right, let's do the hind leg. So I always tell people that if 
I was going to be an insect, I would want to be a dragonfly. Um, because they're awesome predators, for one. But, um, like, pre dragonflies have a 99% catch rate. Um, so when they target food, they eat, which is kind of great. Um, but also when they're naiads, when they're immature, they get to breathe underwater and have gills and be awesome. And then when they're adults, they get to fly. Um, and so I kind of like the idea of being able to both breathe underwater and fly. And there's a species in Australia, I couldn't tell you which one, but there's a species in Australia that can fly 59 miles an hour. And that sounds like a blast. All right, so the femur is going to be coming up from here. I'm going to make the femur come out more at an angle here. So we're going to kind of um, put it out more like this. And the, the meta femur is underneath the mesotibia. Alright, so we've got that femur out. The tibia is nice and long. The tibia is this one right here that comes out from this knee and then goes down to this point. It's going to be, sadly, it's going to go right over the adegas. That's fine. Good thing I have a nice little one, a, ni a nice big one drawn. And then the five tarsal segments are these. One, two, three, four, five. One is actually really long. tiger beetle to me these really really nice long legs and this leg if I was to take it and stretch it out um, it is longer than the length of the body which is what we were looking for the hind leg from the base of the coxa to the end of the tarsi is 1.1 centimeters so 0.1 centimeters longer than the length of the entire body that's true too and they have one of the most ancient styles of wings. Um, they're, uh, the, the dragonfly wings, after they open and harden, So after the uh, dragonfly wings open and harden, uh, they have the uh, they they no longer have the ability to close over top of their body anymore. So when the uh, when the naiad is um, emerging uh, from the uh, from the final exoskeleton, um, it'll unroll the wings from where the wing buds were. So it'll kind of unroll the wings, and they'll be right on top of each other next to each other and then you'll see it'll kind of like wiggle a little bit and then the wings will just like pop open and then once they're in that position they'll dry in that position and dragonflies do not have the ability to close their wings all the way up above their body anymore because of their muscles they just fly like this
There is, though, like a really cool time in the, uh, in the emergence of the dragonfly that you can see the wings above its body for a moment before they... Before they snap open, never to be closed again. We're working on him. All right, let's get to these. Um, I want to count how many antennal segments it's got. Look at them from the top. I think what we're going to do is look at the right side. The left side might have a broken piece, I think. So, one, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Let's go again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So, um, nine segments of the flagellum. So we already have the first two up here. I'll admit my um, my second segment, the pedestal, got stuck underneath the leg, but that's fine. Um, then now we're going to add nine more segments. Each one of them... Uh, The first segment is the longest, and they go, and they are, um, shorter and shorter as the, as they go on. And if you want to compare them to the length of something, it looks like the first segment of the antenna is longer than the first segment, or the first tarsal segment. Or maybe approximately the same length. So if you look at your first tarsal segment, that's the approximate size length of your first antennal segment. And then you can go from there. They were lucky evolution granted them the most successful traits. That's true. So I have an idea of where I'm going. So I want to one... Two, three, four, five. Oh no! I'm gonna try again. One, kind of curl down right here at the end of the paper so that there is enough space. But admittedly, it's kind of fun because uh, tiger beetle antenna do tend to do that. They kind of curl down at the end. So I'm actually pretty happy with how I was able to keep the specimen on the paper. That is 11 antennal segments. Now the only thing that really is left to do on this front here is worry about the, uh, the actual 16 spots. Or in this case, because we're looking at a lateral point of view, it's going to be 8. And then I have some bonus stories about tiger beetles. So we have eight white spots on the elytra. The first one is up here on what you would call the humeral angle or the humeral edge. Uh, the humeral angle is right here on the edge of the elytra. It's kind of like the shoulder. Um, I think you might even want to call it the humeral edge. But that's the humerus right there in that region. Um, so you've got this one white spot that kind of comes up like so. Uh, right, you have another white spot. This one is actually pretty much perfectly circular. So... I'm going to go ahead and just add that circle, and it looks like 
That's about the right spot at placing meant for it. So these two spots that are connected do count as two separate spots. This is three and four. Um, although in most of the specimens that I have seen, they are kind of connected this way where there's this really little thread in between them and then there's this additional spot here one two three four and then you have five down here this one is actually kind of in the way with all the legs and stuff so i'm just going to add that little one here and hope that people see it one two three four five so then you have three here kind of at the end you have six that's like this little upside down raindrop -y type shape and then you have seven that kind of comes up and goes down and then you have eight that finishes the tip here so that is the eight spots on, on this side of the elytra. And I'm just going to drop some graphite in here. I know I'm not using all of the really pretty metallic colors, but I want people to know exactly where the darker spaces are and where the lighter spots are. So I think that that will work fine for me. He is pretty cute. I do kind of love him. All right, so bonus story, tiger beetle grubs, um, they dig themselves burrows. And these burrows are just long tubes in the sand. Um, and these tubes can be very, very deep, even though the specimens are really small. So these little tiger beetles can be, I don't know, a half inch long, but they'll have like a 12 inch burrow or a 14 inch burrow. <laughs> Um, so it's just like this ridiculously long tunnel that they live in. Um, and what they do is they have this very flat head um, that's kind of flat up here on the top. And they do have kind of mandibles up here. So let's see, you've got some mandibles up here. You've got a very, very flat head. All right. And then from here... They have a body where it's kind of, it's, it's weird shaped. They've got their six legs that face in this direction. They come, they have this angle, and then they have this weird like spine on the back of their body. So they're kind of in this odd, and actually they, yeah, more like that. So they're this weird grub shape, so they do kind of look like a beetle grub, but they have this spine on the back of their, um, on the back of their abdomen here that holds on. They've got kind of this little claw here, and it's going to hold on to the sand so that it can levitate in this burrow. So even though this burrow is like, I don't know, 20 times its length, 15 times its length, You've got this buggy here, and he's just kind of floating above this giant tube. <laughs> All right. And then he has two different things. He has two different major behaviors that he can do from here. So if there is a little insect, and it goes do-do-do-do-do-do-do, and he's walking across the ground, and it gets close, the uh, tiger beetle grub will kind of pick his face up, grab his food, and then he lets go of this hook. Uh, piece here and just drops all the way to the bottom and this is where he's protected and he can eat so he uh, he catches food and then he falls to the bottom and then he eats down there and then once he's done eating uh, he'll crawl back up the tube and he'll sit like this again um, so tiger beetles this is why tiger beetles you find them in sandy environments it doesn't have to be a desert um, around lakes and around shores uh, you regularly see tiger beetles running around on like hiking paths because hiking paths tend to be pretty sandy along the edges because they're they're so eroded people are walking on them so regularly um, so this is a kind of fun thing that people do um, uh, you can so um, there are some scientists that try and collect these grubs and the issue is that if you try and collect them and you try and go and pick them up or try and if you disturb them at all and you're bigger than they can eat, they just drop to the bottom of the pit. <laughs> And then it's impossible to find them because they're in this huge thing of sand. So what people do is they take a really, really long piece of grass and they'll stick that grass. They scare the grub and the grub falls to the bottom. 
like it's going to do. And then they stick the grass all the way down the bottom of the tube until they hit the bottom. Sometimes this is 12 or 14 inches, but sometimes you need a really, really long piece of grass. And then, once you know you've hit the bottom of their home, you start digging. And you'll be able to find the specimen pretty much where the grass is. So you, you dig and you follow your blade of grass all the way to where it ends, and that's where your grub will be. And that's how you figure out how to collect these. Uh, why would they need to dig so deep? I don't know why. I think it's just a, I think it's just a defensive mechanism. Like, they just, uh, they just fall. It's like to protect themselves. But I don't know why it isn't like half of that distance, for instance. Um, because I feel like you'd still get the same amount of defense. And the, uh, the way that they breathe would be through spiracles. So they do have little holes in the sides of their abdomen um, that open and close and let air in and out of the body. Um, ideally, when they fall to the ground, well, ideally when they fall to the bottom, uh, the tunnel, the tube is still there. So they still have open access to the air, even though they are all the way down at the bottom. Unfortunately, if their home collapses on them, that's a little bit of a different story. So um, I know I mentioned sand, and um, you might, when you hear sand, you might think like uh, beach sand. Because beach sand erodes really fast, and those holes would collapse all the time. But um, regularly when you're finding these guys, it's in wet sand. Not super wet, but like wet enough that it's going to hold its shape. Um, when you're rearing tiger beetles, if you're rearing a tiger beetle in a lab, you actually mix the sand with cement powder so that their tunnels will hold their shapes. Because, yes, the actual collapsing of the tunnel, I do believe, can kill the specimen, but they, they should be able to dig their way out, but um, I'm sure that there are specimens that, that it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't work for. All that for a little grub. Yep. Gerb. <laughs> That's funny. I love it. So this is my tiger beetle. I'm really happy with the middle and the hind legs and the rest of the body. I, I feel like I could play with the front leg forever. And that's just because I want the front leg to be here. Right through the middle of the head. Um, I think that that's where it would look the most even. If I made these this angle and this angle more close to this angle so like closed it down a little bit but I didn't want it to block all the cool mouth parts so I think that it works uh, let's see this oh you know what maybe I can do it this way no. All right, so this is uh, my friend the tiger beetle here. Um, I love the grubs and their funny shape. I wish I remembered the name for this little hook. This is one of your favorites so far. Aw, yay. That's so good. Um, we've done a couple of tiger beetles, but I personally also think that this tiger beetle is one of the best. Um, I think that the legs turned out really well. So, let me know if you have um, any additional questions. I love to answer bug questions. From this image, you can see the full picture here. This is what my tiger beetle looks like. Um, it is the western red-bellied tiger. Um, and I teach on a platform called at school. Oh, be in frame. I, uh, I teach on a, on a platform called OutSchool. Uh, that's where I teach virtual classes to students of um, school age. So uh, kindergarten to fifth grade is where I spend a lot of time, but I also have some high school students now that are doing kind of entomology college prep type classes, and so that's been a lot of fun too. Um, uh, that is my, that's just a reminder to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I live stream at least once a week. Um, now that we're closing in on winter again, I'm probably going to be live streaming, uh, twice a week again, probably on Sundays, but we'll 
see about that. I am not doing Invertober this. Um, I'm not doing Invertober this year. I probably will be bringing it back next year, but this year I have some like major changes happening, and I think there's going to be two or three weeks that we're going to have to be off in the month of October. Probably October. Let's see, nineteenth. 26th and then November 2nd. I think we're going to be taking a three week break, a three week hiatus. And it might even be four depending on how life goes. Um, so uh, keep that in mind as we are encroaching on October um, that we're going to be taking a little bit of time off. If you've really enjoyed hanging out with me today and you'd like to, you know, drop me $5 for a coffee or something like that, you know, help support Insectopia and help support me continuing to buy uh, materials like pins and uh, collecting gear and things when I break them. I accidentally stepped on my one of my black lights this summer. It was very sad. It exploded. Um, that made me unhappy, but I will be buying another one shortly, <laughs> and it's because of you guys that, you know, I have that little bit of extra money to make sure that all of this thing, all of these things continue going forward, so I really super duper appreciate it. Um, feel like there was something else that I was talking about. Anyway, this is my email address. Feel free to share any um, images. If you were drawing with me, I love seeing your drawings. And I'm really curious how some of you sketched out the, uh, like, the iridescence and the colors. So I would absolutely love to see those if you would like to share them with me. hope your feet were okay. I think they're okay. I just, um, I just have a handful of, uh, yeah. I've just got, I, um, I'm gonna be moving, I think, again. Probably. So, we'll see. Alright. Um, I hope, I hope that you all have a lovely rest of your week. Feel free. Oh, that's where I was going. Next week, we're going to be drawing web spinners. That was the other thing I wanted to add. So, um, web spinner, the web spinner guy will be up next week. He's really cool. He's got these crazy front legs that he uses to spin silk. And I'm really excited to, like, really zoom in and check him out because I haven't done it yet. Um, I just pointed him recently, like, on Tuesday. I just pointed him two days ago. So, um... I am excited about seeing what he looks like and um, getting him sketched. Oh, I hope my feet were okay when I stepped on. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Got it. <laughs> Sorry, I was speaking really fast. I moved through a couple of different stories. Um, yes, my feet were okay. The lamp, unfortunately, didn't make it. Um, the reason was because when I travel with my black lights, I wrap my black lights up in the white sheets. Um, and then I was taking them out, right? So I had taken out the one light and I hung up the sheet and then the other light was still in the sheet and it was sitting on top of the other white sheet. So it just looked like all like a pile of white sheets. And um, I stepped on the sheet thinking that it was going to be okay and there was a bulb inside still wrapped in it. So luckily, um, luckily I didn't hurt myself. Um, because when it exploded, it did so within a sheet, which also means that it was pretty easy to pick up. I didn't get glass all over the desert. Um, but it was a sad loss, because it was a Bioquip light, so Bioquip doesn't exist anymore. Yay! All right, I'm super stoked too for the web spinner. Um, if you look for, if you're looking for me on Instagram or Facebook, I will admit that I haven't been posting very regularly. But if you're looking for me, I am at Insectopia2015 over there on the bottom left corner. I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your week and stay by.